It is truly my honor and privilege to stand here with you today. For today, we witness a dream fulfilled, the culmination of years of preparation and really ascending forth, an affirmation of a calling into the life of set apart ministry. This last New Year's Eve, I find my, found myself with my husband Wayne in New Orleans for the first time in my life. We were there for the Sugar Bowl for the University of Texas to play Georgia. Can you say University of Texas in Arkansas? Oh, there's a horn right there. All right. Well, while there, we did some extra things. And one day we took a trip right outside of New Orleans to visit the Whitney Plantation. The Whitney Plantation is a little unique because it shows life from the perspective of the enslaved peoples. While there, there was a certain statue that mesmerized me. It's called Hallelujah by a man named Ken Adams. It depicts a big, um, strong, enslaved African-American man who, upon the news of emancipation, as he throws up his arms, he falls to his knees, throws back his head with his face to the sun, and it's entitled Hallelujah. It depicts this eruption of joy and gratitude and probably some disbelief that he survived it. And instead of hearing his outcry, you see it. Since I'm a visual learner, that has really stuck with me. Today, we witness such a hallelujah. We are celebrating a woman who is loosed and yet connected to live into her fullest life, the life God created her to and called her to live. Recently on my Facebook uh, post pages i don't post much but there's been a lot of posts about how well we've aged in the last 10 years i'm not playing i don't think it would go so well for me however i love to look back and take stock over what's happened in the last year and especially in the last 10. for you see it was november 2008 that I met a young woman from Arkansas at Perkins School of Theology. It was preview day. Sunilia and I were there with high hopes. S-O-N-I-Y-Y-A-H. She was asked, how do you pronounce that name? Sunilia, cause my mama said so. <laughs> so how did two women of differing ages backgrounds, financial situations, geographical locations, and oh, race, come together. Through vulnerability, through our insecurities, that's how we came together. You see, when you begin seminary, you're pretty sure that everyone there is far smarter than you, and you're certain they're more spiritual. And what first attracted me to Sunilia that day in November was that she looked as scared as I felt. I told her upon leaving that preview day that if we were both accepted, I would find her when we started in January 2009, almost 10 years ago to the date. But now I say that we found each other. She was my safe person. She was the one to whom I could say, I don't get it. It took us weeks to learn how to say eschatological. We thought our professor was sneezing. <laughs> but we held hands and we held on for what would be a wild and bumpy ride far beyond our seminary days. Only in relation to others do you truly learn to know yourself. So lesson number one. 
In our New Testament class, Sunilia and I, of course, sat by each other and somehow always shared the same Bible. She had hers and I had mine, our school sanctioned study Bibles, but for some reason we most of the time used mine. And that Bible is full of our handwritten notes. I can see us now hunkered together over those life-giving text, our blood, sweat, and tears are on those pages. But I added something to those pages that Cenelia did not. It was my spit. For you see, in case you can't see, I was always the one turning the pages. And it took me weeks and months to notice that she was never turning the page. And I wondered why. Why did she never do that? I did it all the time. Well, one day the light dawned. For you see, I had never presumed or been told that my spit might offend someone. I was so indoctrinated that it never occurred to me that she wouldn't feel free to do the same. My whiteness was showing, for I was blind. Those lessons still strike me today. The richness of vulnerable conversations is life-changing. And without ever saying a confrontational word, I began to see life from her perspective. And it wasn't just me. Our professors and our peers said that she was anointed. It was kind of like that old commercial of E.F. Hutton, if you remember in the 70s and 80s, the stock brokerage company, and when the men would be out on the golf course, and someone said, well, my stock broker is E.F. Hutton, and he said, and all activity ceased, and everyone leaned in. That's how it was when Cenelia spoke. We all leaned in, for she was anointed, as we read in Luke 4, 18 and 19. She was anointed to preach good news, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. It was to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and no one can proclaim it no one can tell it. No one can share the good news like the one who's been through it. She whet my appetite to study and learn and read and listen. I was woke. And once you're woke, there's no going back. Only in relation to others do we truly know ourselves and our blind spots are revealed. Scripture has a way of revealing our blind spots as well. And in today's story, you will see some of Cenelia's story, some of my story, some of our story, and I trust and hope some of your own stories as well. For we see the vulnerability of Jairus, a leader in the synagogue, a person in a position of power, be it limited power, but yet he's powerless to help his little daughter. Desperation drives him. He needs help, and he comes to Jesus, falling on his knees, hoping the rumors about him are true, and begging for help. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live, so that she may be made whole and live. Come and lay your hands on her. I saw in your bulletin this morning that you are a movement for wholeness. I like it. The little daughter is vulnerable to illness, on the cusp of life, yet her very life is on the line. 
She is a passive character in this, possibly unaware of the gravity of her situation, or perhaps in so much pain she doesn't even care. But she had an advocate, and he is begging for Jesus to lay hands on her. And then we meet the nameless, statusless, penniless woman with no community, exploited by doctors who took her money and left her worse off. She is out of resources, with only one constant in her life, a 12-year flow of blood, leaving her weak, sick, sick and tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, with no one to advocate for her, marginalized, unaccepted, alone, alone. She is knocked down and knocked out, but with one last desperate hope. If only she could lay her hands on Jesus, even if it's just the hem of his garment. I wondered why the hem? Is she that weak that she can only crawl? Or is she that low? Is she that small? Does she feel that invisible and unimportant that that's all she thinks she's worthy of? Anyone can relate to such hopelessness, helplessness, desperation, isolation, rejection, abandonment, lack of resources. She has no more fight left. She's out of time and out of hope and devoid of a future. Tomorrow we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we remember his yet to be fully realized dream and the moments when dreams are dashed, moments when sacrifices seem wasted and pointless, moments when we have been othered, moments when we want to pull under the covers and hide our heads and hunker down and hide out on the couch, when we need to lick our wounds because we want to give up. Anyone been there? I have. And the worst of it all is when the wounds are inflicted by kingdom people, by the church. Those wounds can seem fatal. They wound our spirit. At one such time in my life and Cenelia's life, she sent me a recording of a song, Take Me to the King by Tamala Mann. Anybody heard it? Oh, I wish I could sing it. You don't want me to. But I have to tell you some of the words. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart's torn in pieces. It's my offering. Take me to the king. I'm tired. Options are few. I'm trying to pray, God, where are you? I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't think. What's left to do? Take me to the king. Truth is I'm weak. No strength to fight. No tears to cry, even if I tried. But still my soul refuses to die. One touch will change my life. Take me to the king. Suffering is the great equalizer. Suffering does not discriminate. Hallelujah, neither does God. Jesus had the power to alter their conditions. Jesus has the power to raise us up from death to life. Jesus has the power to renew us, restore us, reconcile us, and remember us. To community. The woman's flow of blood stopped as the power of Jesus flowed into her. If it is there for the taking, if we but touch the hem of his garment, if we have the courage to try again, even in the face of great fear. And don't miss the part where the truth spills out of her. It spills out. It's overflowing. She tells the whole story of her physical pain, her emotional pain, her mental pain, and yes, her spiritual pain. 
truth-telling is essential. It is said we often have to tell our story seven times before our healing begins. We may have to take to the couch, but while there, we learn to embrace the feeling and move forward in faith that God has something more for us. When the world says you're unworthy, ignore that. For I know in Isaiah 43, it says, I formed you. I called you by name. You are mine. And we were reminded of that last Sunday, right? Baptism of our Lord. Your name is beloved because God says so. This nameless woman is claimed and called daughter. Jesus sees her determination and her intention and calls it faith. Faith, seen as determination and intention. I love that. And when Jairus is told that his little daughter is dead, Jesus says, ignore that. Do not fear, only have faith. Believe, trust. Believe what? Trust what? Trust who she's dead. Trust what brought you there in the first place. Trust what brought you to Jesus in the first place. Jesus didn't tell the little daughter to pick herself up by her bootstraps. No. He took her by the hand and he said, little girl, arise. One translation said, get up, kid. I'm going to translate it myself and I'm going to say, I'm going to help you get up. We're going to hold hands, and we're going to hold on, and we're going to get up now and make no mistake. I'm with you. I've got you. When the little girl got up, everyone went crazy. They're ecstatic, my translation said. And then Jesus says, don't, don't tell anyone. Uh-huh, right. Get her something to eat. Feed her. See, I think there's two reasons for that. I think there's such an energy and a synergy in that room. But Jesus is afraid they're just going to recycle that joy among themselves. We're going to talk about it in secret for as long as we can remember. And he says, no. Let it motivate you. Let it inspire you. Feed her. Do something with it. Don't just hold on to it. Do something with it. And the second reason I think Jesus said that is because he knew she was weak. She's been through it. She's weak as a kitten. She needs to get her footing. She needs to be reoriented to life. And then she's going to need to take a tentative first step. What would that be? Sometimes it's about getting back to the basics. Isaiah 58. A text we shared when we were knocked down and knocked out. And it gives some hearty advice. Share your food with the hungry. Invite the homeless poor into your homes. Put clothes on the shivering ill-clad. Be available to your own families. Do this, and the light will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. If you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will show you where to go. Enter, Miss Charlotte. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places, firm muscles and strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew, rebuild the foundations from out of your past, You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, 
rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Go, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. Sometimes the healing begins when we get out there and get back to basics. And the light flickers into a flame shining on you and in you and through you. Sunilia does the funniest thing. <laughs> I can't even count the time she's done it since yesterday when I arrived. If I say, what are you doing? She says, we are. And you have to figure out who's the we. She'll say, we're going to get our doctorate. And I'll say, you go right ahead. <laughs> she says, we're going to get a tattoo. <laughs> and I'll say, you go first. <laughs> I'll say, you did it. And she'll say, we did it. And I think maybe she's right. Jesus has the power to alter people's lives. Do we? Can we bring healing to troubled circumstances? Hmm. Perhaps the healing comes when someone reminds you of who God says you are, beloved. Maybe it happens when you're that little girl peering through the gate of your community that seems to lock you into hardship, Hatred, poverty, hunger, and locks you out of the abundant life that God promises. But then God plants a dream in a vision in your heart and on your life and imprints in you the message, do not fear, only trust. And I believe God says, rise up. We're getting out of here. Determination and intention known as faith. Maybe the healing begins when a neighbor who offers you refuge and communion disguised and served up as an apple. Maybe the healing comes when your teacher and your church see your potential through your invisibility cloak and your resistance to do assignments as a lack of resources because you don't have a shoebox for your diorama and they present you a way out. Maybe it happens when you're carrying a heavy, heavy load on your heart and your new school friends come alongside and apply the salve of kindness and love to an angry, hurting heart. And the hard, protective shell begins to crack. Maybe it comes when a supervisor at work, who is the essence of love and compassion, sets a place for you at her table, a soft place to land and a safe place to learn and you create a new family. Maybe healing comes when you're equally determined, dedicated, and well-intentioned co-worker joins hands with you and encourages you, and you encourage one another. Greater love has no one than she lay down her life for a friend who becomes a sister of the heart with her own extended family, and love expands. Most shocking of all, maybe it's when you sit down with the once greatly feared Popo, working together towards better mutual understanding as to why black lives do matter. Maybe it's when a climate change committee becomes an opportunity for growth when building bridges connects community and engages in vulnerable conversation, 
and when Ainsley's Angels race to raise the bar for full inclusion, healing comes. And especially when the church of your roots says we want you and allows you to labor in love in your own rebirth and then sends you forth to rise and soar and shine. For it is through the cracks that the light shines. We, this collective we, find that the healing is mutual and the one whose hand we hold ends up healing us right back. We did it. It's an uprising. Father Greg Boyles, uh, a man in Los Angeles who has worked with the um, people struggling with drugs, violence, and gang life, has worked with them for 30 years in Homeboy Industries, writes in his new book, Barking at the Choir, these words. The homies have taught me that I am not somebody. I am everybody. Everybody. 